Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. The, the problem with reparations is what, what percentage of white people do you think actually owned slaves? I don't know. It's less than 1%. Really? Yeah. Hmm. And the other problem is money doesn't solve poverty. If money solved poverty, then like people could just throw money at a poor person and they'd become rich. But with lottery winners, they're, they're like, they go broke faster than anyone. Yeah, it's about like managing money and being able to run a business. Like I think reparations possibly at the time, like at the time, but you can't like, like how mm -hmm. you're making people that didn't do anything pay for something their great, great, great parent, grandparents did. Mm -hmm. Even if you did the direct descendants, like most people immigrated here after slavery. Like my, like I have a grandparent from Lithuania mm -hmm. or a great grandparent from Lithuania. Oh, you're saying that. Okay. I thought, okay. Like, I like, and you have to understand mm -hmm. even in, and then what about the white people that fought on the other side? That fought against. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost like, like, I just don't know how that would work. Well, the first thing we need to deal with is what she said in the very beginning, that the number of whites that owned slaves was less than 1%. Well, that's a lie. Let's just call it what it is. You're talking, a whole civil war was fought because of slavery. You're telling me that the white American populace fought an entire civil war because 1% of the white populace owned slaves? Do you know how ridiculous that sounds? Pardon me, not to mention, at the time of the Civil War, the black population in the South, sorry to cut you up, black population in the oh, South. Oh no, you fine. It was five to one, five to one. Why were there so many black people in the South at that time? Because the rest of the white people weren't owning slaves? What was the, what was the whole point of the three-fifths compromise? What was that about? So that three, let's do the math here, okay? The whole point of the three-fifths compromise between the North and the South in order to make the Union, what we know today as the United States, was that three, that the, they would count three-fifths of Black people as their populace in order to get re um, uh, representation. So you mean to tell me that 1% of the entire population of the South, who only one percent own slave, and they needed their their, their slaves to rep to represent, that's going to make a, a dent in the representation problem. They were literally not going to join the union because of this issue. Like, why are you lying? And there's so many things. Sorry to cut you off, man, but what I heard that I'm like, like, what are you talking about? Nothing you're saying it makes any sense. But there is a massive culture war. That is happening in our time. It is probably the largest culture war that that has happened in the Western history, more so than even the, the Civil War, because at least that was clear. But now this culture war, again, front and center is black folk. Again, always, right? always, as, always, as always, and the whole point is to get black folk to pick a side. Either you're going to be on the right side or you're going to be on the left side. That's it. Just like the North and South South days, it's the same thing. America right now is at the cusp of becoming like fractured countries. It's like a very serious situation. So people like I don't even want to talk bad about uh, about Thomas Sowell. Don't, <laughs> he don't does, get me don't get me started. This where you started. and I this where you and I differ on that. Yeah, yeah, because I know Thomas Sowell from since the nineties. Since the eighties for me. Since the 80s for you. Okay, so look, Thomas Sowell is what you call controlled opposition. He is the answer to the controlled opposition of the civil rights movement. Because you gotta remember, there was a controlled opposition for the civil rights movement. Those are the people that got paid by your government to, to lean towards integration and these type of things, and black feminism and whatnot, right? To, 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 to gear the, the civil rights movement in that direction. So as you see today, the, the those same tempos are now leaning uh black people towards the lgbtq it's the same people right the answer to that on the other side are people like thomas Sowell. thomas Sowell is is from the um booker t washington uh camp where essentially he's saying that the key uh for our success is education we have to agree we have to agree key education is important right we have to agree there we have to agree that's you know 
uh, taking uh, accountability for your for what you do is, is important. We have to agree with these things. But the amount of chucking and jiving this guy does and revisionist his history, that's a problem. So now he's the one who's coming up with this these revisionist points and allows white folk like this to say things in public like only 1% of white people own slaves during slavery. You have got to be kidding me. Anyway, sorry, I, that was a long no, time No, you're fine, you're fine. Another way, as many historians have done, like um, Sarah Pruitt on mm -hmm. thehistory.com, one of the basic ways to do it is just look at yeah. the census records of 1806, and that alone should tell you. Like, for example, um, I'm looking at an article now. She says it's called The Five Myths of Slavery, and this issue right here is number three mm -hmm. in that article history.com and so, and so she says the idea that the vast majority of confederate soldiers were men of modest means rather than large plantation owners is usually used to reinforce the contention that the south wouldn't have gone to war to protect slavery the 1860 census shows that in the states that will soon succeed from the union an average of more than 32 percent of white families owned enslaved people some states had far more slave owners, like, for example, South Carolina. They had, four, it's like 46%. In South Carolina, you, you start breaking it down to states. And Mississippi, it was like 49%. And Arkansas, it was like 20%. So the goal is to, to look at the census, break them down by states. So she goes on to say that, but as Jamil Bowie and Rebecca Onion pointed out in Slate, the percentages don't fully express the extent to which the antebellum South was built on the foundation of slavery. Many of those white families who couldn't afford enslaved people aspired to own slaves as a symbol of wealth and prosperity. In addition, the essential ideology of white supremacy that served as a rationale for slavery made it extremely difficult and terrifying white Southerners to imagine life alongside a black majority population that was not in bondage. So the point here is, that was just number three. There's other articles, but for the sake of brevity, mm -hmm. I just stick with that. But also you have to look at an issue that is not talked about as well. And that is those whites who couldn't afford to own slaves, that reality didn't stop them from renting slaves. The slave owners could make money renting the slaves out. And another thing that a lot of people have to understand and keep in mind, when we talk about slave owners, mm -hmm. there were levels. You had different levels. You had those that had the big plantations. You had smaller plantations. Mm -hmm. And then you had individual families who owned slaves, maybe one, two, three, something like that. So it varied. But according to many historians, it is estimated 46% mm -hmm. of white people own slaves. So this issue she's bringing up, and, and then now what, what tripped me out listening to this, she said less than 1% in this, but back in 2016 up to 2019, it was 1.4%. We're starting to see a decline in the percentage. Right? It's, it, it's funny you mentioned that because W.E.B. Du Bois, he wrote that a conservative estimate of the people who died in the middle of he said a conservative estimate is approximately 100 million black people. Look at the numbers today. If you see how low they are, some people are saying 12 million, some people are saying 15 million. Why are these numbers all of a sudden becoming lower and lower and lower in, in our time? It's because the same thing that you're mentioning right now, they're trying to minimize the damage that was done through slavery. In Congo alone, it is well known, just Congo, that the time at the time of King Leopold, during his invasion of Congo, go late late 1800s, he killed approximately 10 million Congolese in the Congo alone. Yeah, no one talks. No, no one talks about that. And he did that in his lifetime. And you mean to tell me? that it is a far-fetched estimate that 100 million black people died over a 300 year period traveling from the Western African uh, Peninsula all the way to South Africa, to the Caribbean, to, to, to and finally America. Not to mention the insurance racket that was happening during that time, where these, uh, which, uh, these slavers were making money from insurance from making their boats sink. And what you were saying about 
the the economics behind renting out slaves ironically when slavery ended it was way more cheaper to to get slaves after the ending of slavery after the after the uh, immense so-called emancipation right. proclamation that's right through convict leasing now what you have is a is a situation where black people were being arrested with impunity under what was known as black codes what is what is a black code a black code is a seemingly um innocent law that is seemingly you know like universal that's a universal law so for example vagrancy is illegal right you're not allowed to be a vagrant right and this is a real black code but everybody knows that even though the language of the law is universal everybody knows that this law is applied specifically for black people mm -hmm. in order to kidnap black people and then they would throw them into the jails you get me and then from there any slave owner can can go and lease that convict or buy their their freedom and rent out their labor at a fraction of the cost literally a fraction of the cost and it would to buy a slave and mind you there was international pressure from india from china from europe all over the world to keep slavery going because of the cotton market the cotton market at that time was like the oil market today the cotton and the sugar market like how we see oil today that's what how cotton and sugar was you get me so th there was a tremendous amount of pressure for america specifically because they were the cotton they're the cotton producers in, in the western hemisphere right to put their slaves their black their newly free black people back into slavery how did they do it Jim Crow, okay? Right. Don't tell me nothing about no 1%. You must right. be joking me. Right. Paper gold. You see, black folks are chumps. If America were to tell you to bring all the rocks in this country to her, and she'll give you a million dollars for it, you'll do it. And the next day she'll tell you, we're using rocks for currencies, chump.